So with us today, we have Matt Kinley, and he is the co-founder and manager of the Manchester Story, uh, which is a venture capital firm here based out of Des Moines, uh, with a focus of insurance, uh, healthcare, and also financial services uh, startups that are trying to scale in that space. So first off, thanks, Matt, for joining us and being here today. Sure. Happy to be, happy to be here. So we're going to dive in a little bit and kind of start off with when you were young, did you ever imagine yourself in this space of venture capital and leading these investment deals for startups? Uh, yeah, great question. No, I did not. You know, I grew up on a farm in eastern Iowa, kind of caught the tail end of the farm crisis. So I, when I went to school, uh, I mean, this is back in the late 80s, early 90s. I, you know, I was trying to find a job, right? I mean, I wasn't even thinking about venture capital or investment, had really no exposure to it. So uh, I, I, my only criteria, having grown up on the farm and seeing the impact of weather, you know, an uncontrollable variable, I knew I was not destined to be a farmer. That was, uh, that was not, I did not like an uncontrollable variable that could make or break your year. So, mm -hmm. no, that's, I, I never, ever really envisioned until college time to even learn uh, about the space. Mm -hmm. So do you remember kind of what you wanted to be like, even in college, like what was kind of your career that you thought you'd be going in? And is it that now or has it overlapped? Uh, no, it's interesting. I mean, I grew up wanting to be an architect, but then I figured out that you actually most really good architects are good artists and have some, some quality drawing skill. I, mm -hmm. that quickly disqualified me from that profession. I'm not talented in that space. So when I went into school, you know, I, I thought business, business space, uh, went in, I, I went to school, you and I, uh, went in the business school there. And that's, that really led to my first job at KPMG. Uh, but I didn't, you know, I grew up as an architect and that ended quickly. Uh, and, uh, but it was always focused on business somewhere around business or finance. Uh, KPMG is a great landing spot because you got to see a lot of different businesses. And uh, that was a good first step for me. Okay. So can you kind of talk about a either influential moment or even person in your life? Uh, sure. You know, I think uh, people in my business career, there's really, there's really two uh, that, I, that I think of. One is an individual named Suku Radia. Uh, Suku was a partner at KPMG when I started there. I didn't get to know him until about a year and a half, two years in. But I got to work very early in my career with Suku. He's an extraordinary person. Uh, he ran Baker's Trust for 10 plus years, retired a few years ago. He, he's in the business hall of fame, all that kind of stuff. But Suku is a great mentor. A uh, good friend today. I don't see him often enough, but uh, Suku was great exposure for a young person, you know, pretty new out of college. That uh, that I was lucky to connect with him. And then, really, second was uh, John Papa John. I got connected to John pretty early. You know, after about four and a half, five years at KPMG, I bumped into John and really got connected uh, or learned about the venture business. Uh, and then, of course, I started to work with John. John had a partnership, entire venture business with him. Went through a lot of cycles, a lot of ups and downs. You know, it was it was good, but I uh, couldn't couldn't really ask for a better teacher in the venture mm -hmm. business. So I was very lucky to have hit both Suku and John very early in my career. Uh, they both had a big impact. Okay, and how long were you working with John? Um, and when that was through the Papa John um, Equity. Equity Dynamics is the venture Dynamics. firm, which okay. is really a single family office. You know, one hundred percent focused on venture. That's what that's what Papa John or it's also called Papa John Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I worked with John for twenty two years, almost exactly. Wow. So long time. Went through a lot of you know late nineties uh, when I was when I was just a kid, and, but you know saw the the IPO or the uh, inter first internet craze, and then we call it the nuclear winter in venture from about two thousand when the market crashed to about two thousand and two. That was some tough times uh, in the venture business. And then, you know, a lot of, a lot of great times, a lot of, you know, 60, 60, 70 deals I did with John over that time period. So, okay. you know, from, from early investment through a lot of exits. So again, great, great training ground, great experience uh, over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so now you guys are leading Manchester story. So can you kind of talk about 
the role and work that you're doing now, or has it changed much even from working with John? Uh, it has changed some, right? Because okay. John's, uh, well, Papa John Capital, single family office, very early stage investments, mm-hmm. working with companies. Now, uh, and now we have a fund, right? So we raise an institutional fund, which is great because you have committed capital, uh, but but there's also uh, a whole other side of the business, right? Of dealing with capital providers, your your limited partners. So it just adds another dimension to the business. But primarily, you know, my my day job is primarily focused on finding exceptional entrepreneurs, you know, early stage companies. That part's the same. You're know, trying to find the best entrepreneurs with great ideas uh, that can build great businesses. That's the the crux of what I do and what I've done for more than 20 years now. So okay. that's, that's the same. So kind of going into working with startups, like what kind of startups excite you when you do see them? Like what are kind of the, either the makeup of the startup or also maybe even just focusing a little bit about the industry and what you guys look for? Well, industry at Manchester story, we are focused on, Insure tech, so anything that touches insurance. There's a lot of overlap there with fintech, so we're broadly across fintech. And then the third category is health tech. And again, lots of overlap with insurance because basically 70 cents of every healthcare dollar goes through a health insurance company, right? So uh, those are the three broad sectors. I mean, what are we looking for? We're looking for exceptional entrepreneurs that have generally early stage businesses. You know, we, we are series C or series A investor. So these are generally rounds of anywhere from as low as say 2 million up to 10, $12 million, you know, investment round. So usually they're revenue generating companies, but they're pretty early stage companies. But we're looking for, you know, exceptional founding teams that, that you're either, either have a way to go after our market, you know, going against the incumbents or, many times working with the incumbents uh, to make their business, you know, whether it's on the distribution side or making their business more efficient. So there's a lot of different angles there, but we're looking for, it's, it's mostly around team. You know, it's exceptional teams that, that either know the space or are learning the space and have a new angle, new technology, a way to go after it uh, that we think ultimately we're looking for businesses that can scale, right? That can be really large business. Ultimately, maybe not a leader in the whole industry, but leader in their sector, right? We want to bet on companies that can be winners or the leaders in their very specific sector. That's, that's important for us. Okay. And so like, how does actually, how do you see success actually in your role? Like, I know what success looks like probably from the entrepreneur, like they do scale it and hopefully they have an event. Um, But what does that look like for you in managing a fund? Well, it's success for our fund uh, and, and our investors, our limited partners. Mm-hmm. It really depends on success of our portfolio. So ultimately, you know, we're measured on our investment returns over the long term. So we're very focused on, you know, how do we find the best companies and work jointly with them to build value over time, right? So that's, it, it all comes back to the portfolio companies and the entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. finding the best entrepreneurs that can create value. That's where we want to make our bets and and also spend our time and help those companies succeed and build more value. That's that's ultimately how we see in this business long-term. You have to provide returns to your limited partners and how you do that is finding the best entrepreneurs that create valuable companies that ultimately exit and and return capital. Okay. So kind of on the opposite end, like what are some of the, either the common pitfalls that you see when maybe a startup approaches you and you know right away you can't invest in them or they're not ready, um, or even startups, the challenges that have happened as they have scaled. Uh, can you talk about kind of that front row seat? Uh, sure. Uh, I think when companies approach us, you know, common pitfall. I mean, we we see a lot of companies that that really aren't ready, right? They don't have their story tight. Uh, they're not ready. I mean, it, it, one interesting thing you think about my job or uh, many venture people, it's they're sorting through all these companies every day. There's companies coming in. So a challenge we have is, is where do we spend our time? Mm-hmm. Right. Where, what companies are we going to dig deeper in? Cause you can't dig deeper in all of them. So that first meeting is critical, right? I mean, it's the hook 
they've got to get the firm excited enough to really spend more time. So you have to, you have to be prepared, have to have all this stuff ready. Also the introduction, you know, how your path to, to the meeting is really critical uh, okay. because if it's a cold deal off the street, it's unlikely we're even going to take a meeting or unless it's super exciting in the space, you know, may, may reach out, but usually it'd be tough to even get in the door versus if it comes through, you know, another one of our entrepreneurs or through a director, a co-director in another deal, uh, you know, we just we pay a lot more attention, give those a lot higher priority. Uh, so it, that's that whole component. My, my point is, it's competition for time of, of when, you know, so you have to be ready and give a good pitch uh, and, and be ready really to tell the story. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a lot. Sometimes it's one shot, right. And you got to make sure you land it, land the plane properly. So, so we can have the second meeting and dig deeper. Yeah. So I, that's mean, the thing. I mean, a lot of times I'm just surprised how often I see entrepreneurs not really ready uh, with with what I'd call, you know, basic questions that, that venture investors ask. Mm -hmm. So I guess how often, like in a given year, do you think your team sees a pitch, like gets to that first meeting? How many first meetings do you think your team looks at? Oh, great question. I could probably quantify that. <laughs> they, you know, it's hundreds, right? It's, it's a lot, but, mm -hmm. uh, but a better question, is how many second meetings do we have? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the, the answer to that either. But that's the goal, right? I mean, how do you how do you uh, come across strong enough and we get excited uh, that we're going to move it up on our priority list of what we're focusing on? Because uh, mm -hmm. you know, every week we have meetings every week where we sort through our deal flow and we're reprioritizing all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's I mean that's that's just a challenge. There's a lot of noise in the marketplace. A lot of companies pitching almost all venture investors. Yep. So you need to be ready and have your story put together. So, so it resonates. Yeah. So kind of talking about the key, like the three industries you guys invest in, which is the insure tech, FinTech and healthcare tech. Um, what are you currently seeing as some of the, the biggest challenges just facing the industry and, and how can startups and entrepreneurs, you know, come in and, and build true value? And maybe you take it one at a time, or if there is an overarching challenge that you're seeing right now, I would just be curious. You know, it depends if the startup is selling into the market, like selling to the incumbents mm -hmm. or selling against the incumbents, right? Because if you're selling, if you, let's say you get a new direct consumer product and you're selling the service against existing banks, as an example, you know, number one, that can be super expensive to reach your customers. You know, do you have some unique channel? I mean, we look for some unique channel so you can have a reasonable customer acquisition cost because it's just to sell that direct is, you know, really capital intensive and inexpensive and do the, do the economics work at scale. They may work on a very small introductory scale, mm -hmm. but, but will they work on a broader scale? That's, that's tough to prove. Uh, it takes a lot of capital to get there. And you may find out, find out when you get there that it's not that attractive a business. That, that's the risk in it. Mm -hmm. If you're selling into the industry, uh, you know, and I think of, again, our industries, insure tech, insurance, financial services, healthcare, I would say uh, sales cycle is a killer, right? I mean, it's, these are generally very large organizations that aren't known for their speed. So the sales cycle can be a real killer. And it's critical to get some early wins, to win some early logos, to build credibility, right? To be a player in the space. That's mm -hmm. that's really critical. Uh, something clearly we look for that we can actually help with, right? Mm -hmm. Also, but uh, but that's, so it's a different challenge, but you have to, you know, you have to be ready for that sales cycle. What can you do to shorten that? Um, how are you structuring your product? How are you structuring your process? Uh, but, but a certain part of it is industry specific and you, you can't budge, you know, some, some of these companies can't move along very quickly. So you just have mm -hmm. to be prepared for that and part of your strategy. So that's, that's a big challenge. Okay. And then I guess even kind of broader too, like when you, when you think about healthcare and insurance, even, um, are there any like large like challenges and gaps or opportunities, honestly, where, um, people can solve for. So 
and not necessarily from like, I know you're sharing from here's what you need to be prepared. Like if you're an entrepreneur trying to uh, disrupt something, but overall, like where are you seeing the industry challenges like fall into as it relates to healthcare and insurance? Oh, there, there's so many opportunities. I mean, healthcare yeah. and, and uh, Papa John capital was much more focused on healthcare, probably, you know, 50, 60% of what we did. Mm-hmm. One thing I love about healthcare, it's so large. There are so many opportunities that, seem to be very niche plays, but there's, you, you can still build $2 billion companies just because healthcare is so large, right? I mean, and FinTech, financial yep. services and insurance, very similar that way. I mean, really big markets, you know, across, across so many different consumers that, uh, that you can find what may seem like a pretty small problem, but you can still build a pretty big company. Um, mm-hmm. That's, that's something that, and part of it's our industry knowledge and looking across these different industries. I mean, there's certainly some, some companies uh, or some markets that are too small to invest in for mm-hmm. a firm like ours, but, but generally these are really big markets. So, uh, you know, we can find companies that can, you can build substantial companies okay. uh, from, from niche plays in these companies, in these markets. Is there like any past deals that stand out to you that like one, you were, you were proud to at least have an impact in based on what they were solving? Like, are there any stories of, of companies that did make it or maybe did not, but, um, but, but we're really trying to tackle a, an industry problem. Oh yeah. There's, there's a lot. I mean, especially in the healthcare space. Uh, but let me give you an example. We were, uh, this is when I was a pop capital, but we were an early investor in a deal that was was transporting patients, non-emergent medical transportation, so not not ambulances, mm-hmm. but basically getting you know grandma or someone to their doctor's appointment. Mm-hmm. So seems like a pretty small problem, not a major issue. Certain states uh, actually pay for the patient to get there because it pays for that state. You think of a state Medicaid program as an example. It pays for the state to do that because if that patient misses appointments, oftentimes then they end up in the ER and it's a much more expensive visit, right? So that's that's an example of a company. It's simple space. Some of these states are doing it on their own. Uh, we invested very early in that. That grew to be a very large company. And again, very esoteric little niche. You wouldn't think uh, it would uh, it could build a large company. We built a very large company, sold it. Actually, it sold, it traded, you know, traded into private equity hands a couple of times. I saw the CEO, the former CEO, and I just talked to him like six months ago, but I bumped into it at an airport. This is like 10 years after the deal. And he'd sold it two more times. He was still running the business. I mean, it it was seven, eight times even when we sold it, right? I mean, it just continued to grow and grow. And I I can't remember how many patients he had transported to the appointments, but it was, you know, a huge number, right? Because they were a leader in the market. So Mm -hmm. that's an example, but there's all kinds of healthcare companies especially, but even insurance, like in our insure tech companies now, we you know recently invested in a company that that helps companies determine whether or not a self-insured health plan makes sense for them, right? Mm-hmm. Which can save the company a lot of money, can be better service for the employees. So there's there's a lot of potential impact across the portfolio. Mm-hmm. You know, ultimately is it is it a good business? Can it sustain itself? That's what we're looking for. Can you can you create a leader in the marketplace? Because that's where you're ultimately going to build value. Okay. So kind of shifting gears to like someone on the other side who might be interested in investing in startups or maybe one day creating a fund. Um, how do you actually get started? Like for you, it seems like somehow you got to meet two very influential people early on. Um, but do you have any kind of suggestions or recommendations for say even a college student who's really interested or someone, uh, a, a professional that, that knows like, Hey, I kind of have an interest in startups. Um, how do you get started as an investor? You know, that is tough. It's tough. Uh, cause it takes a long period of time. I mean, what you have to really do is to start to build a track record. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the key thing ultimately to raise capital successfully, uh, in the long term. you've got to build a track record and there's a number of different ways to do that. Right. I mean, you can start to invest small dollars and track it, or you can put together in a, you know, there's what they call an SPV route, a special purpose vehicle, mm-hmm. where if you find an interesting deal and you can assemble capital from various people uh, and then invest it and then track you know, track how that performs over time. That's another example. Um, mm-hmm. There's, uh, you know, that SPV route. There's, there's uh, vehicles called pledge funds where you get 
Uh, basically, you sell a group of people on, hey, we're going to go out and buy this software business, as an example. Uh, and you get soft circles for them to support you. Ultimately, you have to go back once you cut the deal. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, very difficult, but that's all around building track record. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's the key thing to do is build a track record so you can ultimately partner up with the right people. Hopefully, they also have a successful track record mm -hmm. uh, and you can raise capital. That's, I mean, that's okay. what ultimately we have now is institutional capital, but it's very hard to get, right? Very hard to do that. You've got to have a track record. You've got to have a good story of what you're going to do with it and mm -hmm. then you have to perform. So, yeah. Even what about angel investing? How would you kind of say the same thing or, or how can you get started even just kind of on a lower friends and family level? Well, angel, yeah. Uh, angel investing, you absolutely can't get started with the lower friends and family level. I, I would suggest um, seek out a network, right? I mean, for instance, in Des Moines, it's Plains Angels, right? In Ames, it's AMC Capital, I think. I know there's a North Iowa group. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really suggest for a new investor to seek out one of those networks. Number one, the learning experience uh, of it and, and just the strength in numbers and the strength of multiple people uh, talking or thinking about a deal, mm -hmm. I think is powerful. So I, that's really a good route. If you, if you want to start an angel investment route, I'd seek out a network and mm -hmm. work within that network as your initial learning tool. That's, that's what I would suggest. Okay. And, and I, I don't know if it's common, like at Manchester story or other funds, but do you guys ever like have apprenticeships where even college level students could kind of learn the ins and outs of what it actually means to whether it's to be an, an, an analyst or whether it's to, you know, go through like, what is due diligence or how do you actually look at deals and know that it's a, a qualified uh, deal to look at like any tips and tricks there? of how to get started in the industry? You know, we, we do offer internships in the summer okay. uh, in a lot of, a lot of firms. I think a number of firms do. I, I think it's, it's absolutely a great idea if you can get one. I mean, yeah. it, the number of people seeking internships versus the, the slots is not, uh, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of slots available, right? I mean, yeah. generally it's a pretty small industry, the venture mm -hmm. business. Uh, and if you can get an internship, I really highly recommend do it. It is great experience. Uh, there was also some programs like probably the most well-known is the Kauffman foundation program in Kansas city. They've got this whole venture program. I think it's pretty expensive. I don't know the numbers, but, but it's really a good program. Uh, super successful. There's programs like I think Stanford and Berkeley have separate, you know, non uh, like professional development programs around venture. I'm sure there's quite a few out there, but those are some. That okay. are yeah. Cool. So um, kind of going into the community, what do you see is kind of like the, the pulse of the investor community in the state of Iowa today? I know like you do look at deals outside of Iowa, but just from many years of experience, um, what have you seen over time in the investor community as it relates to startups in Iowa? Well, I think the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem Mm -hmm. feel stronger than ever to me. I mean, I think we've continued to build momentum uh, and I'm really excited about that. I mean, I think we've continued to make great progress uh, and the, from the investor point of view. I mean, I also mm -hmm. think there's more capital available now than there ever has been. So that's positive. I, you know, I don't have my pulse on angel capital here, mm -hmm. uh, but I would guess more angel capital, certainly more institutional capital available. Yep. Um, you know, it's interesting. The other thing from an entrepreneurial point of view, it takes less capital to start a business now than it did say 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It takes more, it might take more capital to scale it, you know, to build it up. But if you can start a business for less uh, and show traction, show momentum, show, you know, competitive and some sustainable barriers, uh, be able to tell that story, then you can raise capital, uh, mm -hmm. raise outside capital to really expand it. But overall, I think we're, we're headed the right direction. I mean, we could always use, more success stories, right? That's mm -hmm. more success stories. Uh, success breeds more success. I think that's absolutely the case. So I, you know, I, I'm hopeful we continue to have ramp up our number of success stories. Mm -hmm. I think that's well said. Um, and we didn't touch on it, but how does private equity play a role in, in your world? Like I'm assuming that's, you know, after many stages that the startups are going through, 
I don't know how many percentage go into private equity deals, but um, what does that world look like? And can you kind of broadly explain it to people who are, you know, very new at investment? Sure. You know, venture, uh, I mean, you've got the angel investors that are really generally funding very early stage companies. Then you've got the mm -hmm. whole venture community, which are at targeting much higher growth companies that can really scale, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the venture targets, you know, super high growth companies, private equity. Um, and there's of course really large private equity buying out whole companies. Uh, there's lots of mid market private equity, but we view private equity generally as one of our exit opportunities, mm -hmm. because if you build a company substantial enough, uh, you know, maybe it'll go public. That's absolutely a great outcome, but, but also not very common. Uh, most end up in trade sales. Uh, most will sell out to strategic investors or strategic strategic players in the business. But one thing that's been great about being a venture investor, you know, if a company's not going to go public and you're going to pursue a trade sale, we've often, you know, hire a banker, run a process. Where I always think it's going to be, okay, one of four different uh, strategic partners is going to, or strategic investors uh, you know, companies, large companies in the space are going to be the buyer of mm -hmm. uh, a, a portfolio company, but there's so much private equity money out there. And, and if you're, if the company that's, uh, you know, on the block for sale is a platform company, you know, private equity can buy as a platform. So it keeps everyone honest, right? There's enough financial capital with the private equity firms uh, that it, it's a great source of liquidity for earlier stage firms like us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sometimes strategic buyers do buy the companies. Some oftentimes private equity is buying companies as a platform and then they're adding, you know, more companies over time and they're building a larger and larger platform. So that's, mm -hmm. that's all positive for the environment. Yeah. And so much of today's even larger companies, private equity owns a big chunk of private companies today, right? I read something recently here about a private equity company that owns a local Des Moines company. I didn't know, I thought it was family owned, but you know, mm -hmm. it bought out three, four years ago. And that's just part of the cycle. Mm -hmm. Did you notice like, even in the last couple of years, like has private equity and, and in general, maybe the investment world, um, like what, what's happening? It seems like private equity is more and more, and maybe that's just because they're more in the news, but um, has there been a growth in, and maybe even, a growth in exits of companies, uh, successful exits as it relates to whether it is private equity or you do see acquisitions, but what do you get a sense of right now? I think there is more private equity. I, I think private equity, starting with a few firms really moved big into the software space. So we're feeling it more, right? That okay. they're, they're the exit partner more often. Now there's all these large crossover funds, maybe historically hedge funds that are investing very late stage venture uh, that are also flowing in with really big checks. So the, the environment's changed a lot, but there's private equity has been around a long time. It's, it's probably more visible in my business because there's more software focused private equity firms. But I don't, I don't, and I, you know, I think there is more press uh, and it's certainly the industry's grown. I don't, you know, it's, uh, it, but it's been around a long time and I think it will continue to be around for a long time. Okay. So looking at the investors in Iowa, um, how do we like position ourselves as a global leader as it relates to investments? Like, do people think of Des Moines um, or Iowa and do they think of like, OK, there's there's a lot of different investors or opportunities there. What do you get a sense of there? Well, Iowa global leader, I mean, what I think of is what. What are our strengths? Um, so if we want to be a global leader, what are our strengths? Mm -hmm. And I think of, you know, we've got a lot of strength in financial services and insurance and really ag. And I'm sure there's other sectors where we've got a lot of strength, but those are the, the sectors I think uh, where we have, uh, you know, an edge or mm -hmm. some real leadership. So, uh, I mean, like for instance, and I've talked to a couple of people about this, we, we certainly should have more ag ag-related venture capital here. I mean, I, we, we have some, but we mm -hmm. should have one or a couple funds based here, uh, focused on ag, a lot of good ag tech flow. I mean, that's not my space. That's not what I'm focused on, but I have been impressed with what's come out of Iowa State and some of the groups up there. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So, I mean, I, I to focus on what, what do we do to, to uh, become a global leader, I just think focus on our strength areas. Okay. And I think ag is certainly one and also insurance and 
in fintech. That's part of why we're insure tech focused. Uh, it's you know we have we have some investors from Iowa, we have investors from all over the country, uh, but the fact that Iowa is, is such an insurance leader certainly helps us. We see flow because of that. You know, it's sh- shocking how how many times we either entrepreneurs. Uh, or other people in the industry, and you know how many of them have come through Des Moines because the insurance industry is so strong here. Mm-hmm. So, kind of talking about deals, and uh, and maybe even when a, a startup is um, getting started and they're looking at creative ways of finding money, um, are there other outlets that you've seen to be successful too that might not involve? what we were traditionally talking about with like angels and seed and venture capital. Um, but have you seen any other kind of methods of finding money um, as it relates to startups? Uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of different options, right? I mean, I, I remember when, uh, oh, it was the watch company. Um, uh, it, it was uh, one of these crowdfunding deals and they raised, eight or $10 million is a retail product, right? But it was an interesting retail product uh, and they were able to crowdfund it, basically pre-watch sales. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. there's all kinds of different methods today than there were 15 years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not familiar with all those platforms, but there, there's ways to raise capital uh, if you have an interesting enough product or, you know, a, attractive enough service. Yep. Um, it, there's all kinds of different ways. You don't have to go to venture. Venture is certainly not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and if you can build a business without raising capital, you know, that's fantastic. Right. I mean, that's what that's what we're doing with our firm. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that's it's a great way to go if you can, you can go that direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, can you kind of expand on that, actually? Because I think there's a number of entrepreneurs that I even see that I think their go to uh, path is always raising money and they think that they need to be on a fundraising route. Um but what, when, when does it make sense for a, a business maybe not to raise funding? Well, if you have a near enough revenue stream, um, I mean, if you think of, again, you think of our business, uh, our investment management business, uh, my partner and I both had experience in the space, had a track record. Uh, you know, we, we had some, some existing deals so it took us a while to put our story together uh, and go raise outside capital, uh, but not not capital for our business. I mean, outside capital to manage, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which then generated revenue source for us. So we, for Manchester Story, we didn't raise outside capital for our firm. Um, you know, we we self financed it, and and which is great because now we own it and we don't have an outside owner. I mean, that's that's what I'm just saying is. If you can build a business through revenue, I mean that's the best way to build a business. If 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 it, you know if you think of when does venture capital fit, it really fits when you can add capital to a business and it can make it scale much more quickly, uh, and and then build the value, you know, the equity value of the business. That's mm-hmm. that's when venture capital makes sense for so many businesses. If if they can finance it out of revenue or other sources. And get cash flow positive, and then continue to build their business without having to raise outside capital. It's it's great. They yep. they keep the ownership structure simple, and they own hundred percent of it, right? I mean, that's fantastic. You can get that route. I'm uh, what I'm just saying is, uh, venture capital is not not made for every business, not made for every situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I I think we media uh, and you see the deals and you see those announcements, but sometimes it's much better um, to bootstrap and obviously find that revenue. Um, when you get started or shortly after. So that's awesome. Um, and I guess kind of to get to the ending a little bit and in, in closing, but is there anything that is kind of on your wish list that you would like to see as it relates to our entrepreneur community, whether that's Des Moines, whether that's Iowa, the Midwest, um, anything like, you know, that you, you think that, okay, if we had this, it would make, it would make things so much easier as it relates to, entrepreneurship or even investments? I, I think there's been a lot of success. I, I think uh, Iowans by nature are less uh, braggadocious about their successes. I, I can tell you, if, if more people talked about the successes or there are more stories published, it would help put more fuel on the fire, put more fuel on the fire for investors, uh, for other, you know, people that want to be entrepreneurs or other entrepreneurs to 
to, you know, to have the uh, confidence to go out and do it saying, you know, if, if they can do it, I can do it. I, I think that's, that's part of it. And you, know, you think of, I was thinking about the difference between um, say Iowa angel investors and, and investors in the Bay area. And there, there is a difference, right? Because investors in the Bay area, if they've been active in this community a long time have seen, I mean, they've had their share of failures, but they've also likely either seen or participated in some of these massive success stories. We, we have some of those, certainly not as many of those. And so the network's not as big. I mean, this is a network business, right? Whether it's network of angels or network of venture firms. Um, so building on our successes and publicizing those, I think is important because uh, that will lead to more capital, which will lead to more successes. So that's, that's probably the number one ask is, uh, you know, I think, I think we need to publicize this, the success stories a little more. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. And, and you were saying we need to build even a bigger network. And so how can people kind of closing out, like become part of these networks? Like, is, is there a grid person like yourself or, or how do you kind of get started as you're thinking about, well, you know, maybe I do have the, the ability to invest in startups and, and maybe have a more diversified portfolio. Um, but where do you look for and get started? Uh, good question. Um, and it is tough to break into the networks. Uh, I, I think it's, it's it, one successful deal leads to another or maybe one successful job. I mean, I think if I was a, a college kid today and I wanted to be in this entrepreneurial world instead of work for a large company, Mm -hmm. You know, it, nothing wrong with going to work for a pretty early stage company. Now, ho hopefully it's a winner and not a loser, right? Because there's a lot of losers, a lot of companies that don't make it and even, you know, follow their own. But, mm -hmm. you know, one thing that's, that's a great trend uh, in the entrepreneurial society that I've seen in the last call it, 10 years, more and more young people basically are choosing a career path of entrepreneurship. And it's not, I'm going to start a company and build this for 30 years and then sell it and cash out. It's, I, I can start a company uh, or I can be involved in a company. Maybe it goes three to five years and there's a liquidity event. Maybe they make a little money, maybe they don't, but then they jump into another early stage company. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen so many more repeat entrepreneurs that have done, you know, they're on their third, fourth, fifth company. You know, a number of them didn't work. Maybe one or two of them have worked. Mm -hmm. But they're still at it, right? And it is, it's it's a great business. It's a high energy business. It's generally a, a very smart group of people trying to build something of value or do something that can really change things. I mean, it's exciting. It's exciting to work with that group as an investor, but I totally get why entrepreneurs, you know, it's uh, they feed off themselves, right? And then they uh, get excited about it. And, you know, they maybe they cash out of a deal and take six six months or 12 months off and travel the world. And then they, figure out what their next deal is going to be. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's fun to do that. And I, I like that as a career path for more and more uh, people. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. going to work for everybody. It's certainly not for everybody. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of tough times. It's a roller coaster being an entrepreneur, a lot of, a lot of up days, a lot of down days, but it's, but it is a fun path if, mm -hmm. if it fits, you know, the personality. Yeah. So. And I know I've seen that even around Iowa state where there's been acquisitions and now those startup founders or even you know, in on that founding team, they're now investing, which is pretty cool to see that kind of, you know, that circle, uh, make its way, um, and seeing even more startups happen from that. So, yeah. Think, and we certainly, you know, we, we need more of that, right. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that cycle, that's uh, it's a hugely positive cycle. Uh, I'm super excited about it. We just need more and more successes. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Matt, for taking the time to be on the podcast here today. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts. You know, I go back to uh, Judy Isles, her, her famous line at the end of her emails was start something, right? I, I, I love that because it's, it's don't wait, just act. And whether that's go start a company or start to invest or start to explore investing, right? It can be both ways. Uh, that's, uh, that's certainly something I continue to remember. And, and I'm, I'm on that page, right? Like we try to move the ball forward every day. Mm -hmm. Probably the second one is, you know, the Iowa startup ecosystem is, is a small fish in a big pond, right? So we need, we need to help each other with networks. Mm -hmm. We need to help each other with introductions and contacts. You know, we try to do our part, but I really urge everyone part of the ecosystem to reach out and try to help people, and, and, you know, especially a fellow Iowan, whether it's an investor or an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one thing. I mean, it's you know we're we're bootstrapping the state up, right? In terms of our entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, we need to get more capital in here. I think that's going the right direction. But I think expanding contacts for everyone in the environment or in the whole ecosystem is important. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Those were, I mean, that that's exactly I think what we do need. And kind of going back to that point of start something. Um, you know, you liked it. I liked it. Um, but Iowa State actually decided to create that whole campaign using that Start Something campaign. Oh, uh, that why she... It was so well liked that they took that from Judy. And, uh, you know, and, and it's so cool to see that that's actually a whole uh, campaign around a university campus. Thanks for listening to Small Business and Startup Stories DSM. Inspired by these stories, we offer a hub full of resources needed for any small business owner to grow and succeed in Greater Des Moines, Iowa at dsmpartnership.com slash small business. Thank you for listening.